we have spent a lot of time here on the Seven Figure Small podcast over the last few months discussing the emergence of Web3, the technologies that are enabling it, and what they mean for the future of audience building and community building and the kind of content entrepreneurship and personal enterprise building that so many of us and you are working toward. And if you've been enjoying these episodes, I highly recommend checking out what we have going on over at futurefreedom.com. It's our sister site, uh, and it's a deeper dive on a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about over the past few months. And right now, you can sign up for Brian's free email course, where you will get his current thinking on how to build an exceptional business and lifestyle by embracing change instead of dreading it, because a lot of stuff is changing and that brings with it, you know, stuff that I know people are scared of and maybe worried about and don't quite understand yet, but there's also tons of opportunity with that. And so go to futurefreedom.com, get that free email course, and that will really help you kind of get on the right track for how to think about this stuff and where the opportunities are that you might want to take advantage of right now. This week here on Seven Figure Small, I thought it would be useful to share some advice, both general and specific, that I think will really be helpful for anyone involved in Web3 and at different stages of involvement, whether you're just dabbling and learning about it for the first time, as I know many of you are, all the way to those of you who have fallen fully down the rabbit hole. So we put together a series of do's and don'ts that will hopefully help you seize the many opportunities that are present here and what are still the early days of this transition. And I hope that they will also help you avoid the many, many potholes and pitfalls that remain in what I think is still fair to call the wild, wild west of Web3. And to help me go through these do's and don'ts, I have yet another member of the Unemployable Initiative here to join me. This has been the best part about Brian taking a trip and turning the podcast over to me as it's given me an opportunity to bring our community members here kind of on to the main podcast stage. Uh, And this gentleman is the fourth member now to join me for an episode over the last month. He is Josh Risser. uh, And Josh, you know, really is someone who I think is a great example of how to follow the personal enterprise model of building a successful freelance business and then turning that into additional revenue streams like digital products, which he has done. And Josh is also someone who has really dived headfirst into Web3 and all of its challenges and opportunities. And just recently inside of the community, we did what we're calling an ETH wallet challenge. We're basically helping folks you know, buy ETH, transfer it over to a MetaMask wallet, set up a MetaMask wallet, like kind of the basics that you need to be onboarded uh, to Web3 as a user. And Josh put together all of the educational materials for that and did a wonderful job. Uh, And so I'm really excited to have him here with me for this week's episode. Josh, welcome to Seven Figure Small. Hey, Jared. Thanks for having me. I got to say, it is really trippy to be on this side of hearing the intro and the theme music. I'm like, am I listening to the podcast or am I? Because I've heard all of the episodes, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, it's crazy. But, yeah, thanks for having me on. It's uh, in good company with the other uh, UI members that you've had on so far. Like, I hope I can keep to the bar. Oh, I, I have no doubt that you will. And you really already have because no disrespect to all the other people who have come before you. But you're definitely the best sounding guest that has ever well, been on this podcast. <laughs> I, I would hope so. That is my job. <laughs> that is definitely a job. I mean, I'm in a four by four soundproof booth with a with two like world class microphones um, that has been acoustically tuned. So hopefully, I mean, that's the point, really. And <laughs> I mean, God given pipes that just sound yeah. great. You know, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to have a little bit of resonance. <laughs> so before we dive into the do's and don'ts, I mean, we could actually do a full episode with you just talking about your business and kind of what you've done and how you've built it. Um, so I want to at least touch on that a little bit. Can you describe for us, you know, kind of what you do and, uh, you know, kind of how you've, you know, kind of built up your freelance business and now, you know, obviously getting into some digital products as well? Sure thing. Uh, yeah. So about 20, I want to say like 2015, 2016, I, I started recording, I had a band initially and I had some, uh, some stuff I was recording, uh, recording equipment that I was recording the band with in my basement. And, uh, and I was working for a company and they're like, we need some, we need some stuff recorded. And I'm like, well, I have equipment, so I'll just do it. And then I realized, were you, this, oh, were this you a singer? Something. Were you a singer? Uh, no, I was, I was a guitar player. Okay. Guitar, yeah. Very bad singer. Guitar what was the player. name of the band? I, 
Uh, we we could not come up with a name. That's why we never got out of the basement. Uh, we had the the guy the the guy who is the the songwriter and the the singer. He's down in Colorado Springs, like making a full time job of it now. But we just could not could not get out of the basement. Like yeah. it was it was great. It was fun to play. But man, um, that's like one of the funnest things you can do is like make music with other humans. Yes. Um, but uh, I can't but do yeah, that, so, so I make podcasts. It's the next hey, best podca- thing. Well, it is really close because you're still like creating and like bouncing off of each other as you go. So yeah, yeah. So so yeah, we just like I had the gear. The band had broken up. We we went on hiatus, which basically just means we're done here. Um, and uh, I started recording some like explainer videos for a company that I worked for, and realized like this is this is a cool gig. I could do this full time and started looking into it and realized that because of the technology that had grown so much recording equipment, well, I had a bunch, it was really cheap for really good sounding equipment. And that means that the voiceover industry had moved from LA and New York and Chicago to everywhere. And sure, I wasn't working, you know, union jobs like, you know, like Morgan Freeman might be doing, but, uh, but there are a lot of jobs that Morgan Freeman won't do or they can't afford Morgan Freeman, you know? So <laughs> there's a, then the, the, so then I'm in Montana doing voiceover for a living within a couple of years. Um, so it was, it was crazy. It's a, it's a weird gig. Were you aware of your voice before you started doing that? Like, like, were you aware yes. that you kind of had this great voice? Uh, yeah, I definitely was. I had, um, uh, I'd worked in a call center for a, a while before that. And everyone on the phone was like, you know, you should be in radio. You, know, you should, <laughs> you should really, you should get in radio. And I like, I seem to have this knack for not just explaining stuff to people that kind of calmed them down, but I was taking like escalated. It was a call center for a cable company, not one of the big ones out there, a small regional cable company, but people are not friends with their cable company. No. Um, we did phone and cable TV and cable internet. And it just, we were a good company, but people are not friends with their cable company. It's one of those necessary evils. And I was taking escalated customer calls. And so my job, which if you, if you've read, uh, calm them down with the voice guy, <laughs> basically, if you've read, don't split the difference by Chris Voss, he had that, he talks about the AM DJ voice or the, the late night DJ voice. And I kind of just have that all the time. So, uh, yeah. So people were always telling me that. And I was like, oh, it also kind of works against me sometimes because the sound has changed to a lighter, kind of friendlier guy next door buddy sound. Um, and I definitely have like the, some bass that gives me more of like a polished radio sound just mm-hmm. off the bat. So I have to fight that. But um, but there's still plenty of work out yeah. there. I'm always fascinated by, you know, by people's origin stories, you know, and sometimes how they get into these things. Not necessarily by happenstance, you know, but it's like one thing leads to another. It's like, okay, well, you had this voice and you kind of have this natural talent for doing that, but then you're in this band and so now you've got this equipment and then that leads to the next thing, you know, and it's like this kind of series of steps that you can't necessarily plan for, but if your eyes are open to the opportunity, you can take advantage of it. So you launch this freelance business it becomes really successful and you've done national ads and, you know, and all kinds of stuff. Describe that a little bit. And then now how you're kind of transitioning and what you see is kind of the future for what you want to be doing. Yeah. So, uh, I kind of got started where would these days are definitely the dredges of work in freelance and the freelancing sites out there. Um, and you know, six, seven years ago, they weren't quite as bad. There was still, I don't know. There was, there was just really nowhere else. People didn't know where else to go. And so that was kind of where I started. I didn't know where else to go, like the Fivers and the Upworks and the freelancers. And um, that's where the work was. And so I started just kind of putting some stuff out there and auditioning for jobs and uh, have since moved out of that as I've gotten better and gotten coaching and gotten on some agency rosters and then started like booking those national ads. Um, and so, so I've worked up to that. But then I also found there was this whole part of the industry that was not commercials because everyone thinks like commercials and radio and TV commercials and things like that, like Super Bowl commercials. But uh, there's this whole part of the industry that you never see, which is kind of like the deep web of voiceover, which is internal e-learning. 
And one of my biggest mm. customers is one of the largest fast food chains in the world. Not the largest, but one of the largest ones. And I do almost all of their internal e-learning. And so when they're launching new products and new new initiatives in the company, they send me a script, I record it and send it back and they send me money for it. And it's it's I've become their voice. So now all of their people are just used to hearing me. And then I also along the way managed to book like one of the top 15 YouTube channels out there wow. for kind of like ongoing stuff. So I do a bunch of recording for them too, just on a daily basis. I've tried to send three to five scripts back to them recorded. And so, yeah, there's, there's just a couple of, and I think you'll find this with a lot of freelancing business businesses, the cornerstone of your business ends up being a handful of clients who just keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And then you continually try to find new clients to hopefully backfill those when eventually they're going to move on. You can't depend on these two clients to hold you up forever. And so you try to backfill other long-term clients by finding other short-term clients that then turn into long-term clients. Yeah. Um, so doing that in the e-learning world, I had to launch something to help me market because I am a terrible marketer. I, I, I hate cold emails. I hate cold calls. They can still work. I've booked off of them before, but I was like, I have to have a reason to talk to people. I don't like to just walk up and shove a business card into someone's hand. So I launched a podcast to help people who develop e-learning, but can't book me, can't afford me. There's no budget for it, whatever it happens to be. They have to record their own narration for their e-learning. Mm. So I launched a podcast to help them do that. And then I had a reason to talk to all of these people who could potentially hire me. Ah, the podcast is business myself, card. I love podcast it. Podcast is business card. Yes. And I was actually, I was like, I can't, I don't want to do this forever. So I'm going to do 20 ish episodes of like the core things. And I ended up doing close to 25 or 30 episodes and speaking at conferences, getting paid to speak for um, professional development type things in-house and through organizations. And yeah, and now I'm trying to figure out what's next because AI voice is coming. They're mm -hmm. not going to be able really to infuse like creativity and emotion as much into AI, especially in the next five to 10 years. But what is really around the corner for me? So Am I going to fight AI and try to like swim in the pool or am I going to shift gears? And so my foray into like Web3 has really been like, okay, is there something in crypto for me where I can help grow the ecosystem a little bit, um, mm -hmm. help onboard new people? And so then you guys launched this stuff and it's like a perfect fit at the perfect time. Once again, back to the origin story, like you were saying. Absolutely. Now, have you done anything with digital products too? Am I correct that you have a course as well? Uh, I've been working on a course for a while. Okay. I haven't quite launched a, a full digital product. I've done some coaching for people who have come to my podcast That's or right. saw me speak. And, uh, and I've done some coaching actually with an author in our community. We did a little bit of coaching too, uh, who wanted to do his own audio book. Um, and, uh, but, but I haven't quite launched into a full course yet because I don't know like long term if that's the, like I've written out a ton of it. I just yeah. haven't figured out like, okay, do I want to put the, the actual work into developing and launching and doing all the, cause heard uh, forests call. Like, I'm like, that sounds like a whole lot of work. And I don't know if that's like, I'm yeah. fully committed to that, you know? And I want to do something that I can like just dive into and really enjoy all the way through and not just do it because, Oh yeah, I can launch a course and make, you know, X amount of dollars. Yeah. And maybe it props me up for a few months, but I get burnt out and I don't enjoy it. Like, so I've really, I'm trying to like weigh those, but still working toward it a little bit. So if I decide to go, I'm not, you know, three years behind. Yeah. By the way, I apologize if you can hear any crying in the background. That is my son <laughs> apparently not liking something that is happening out, <laughs> out right. in the living room. I have, you know, <laughs> I have soundproofing in my office, but it does not fully it's, prevent the wails of a child from, from getting never, in here in the middle of the day. It's never enough. It's, it's never, never enough. enough. No, nope. never enough. And he always picks these times to, uh, to mm -hmm. do it. So anyway, that's right. um, well, that's a good segue, you know, because you are, you know, you've, it's really impressed me just, you know, interacting with you over the past few months as we've kind of talked about this stuff, you know, how much you've gotten into, to web three and kind of, you know, looking for opportunities and finding places where you can, 
you know, where you can fit in, just like you did, uh, you know, with helping us develop the tutorials for the ETH wallet challenge. You know, it's such a great example, I think, of the mindset that's going to win in Web3, which is becoming part of a community, but having an ownership mindset within the community of like, hey, there's something that needs to be done. Yeah, I'll step up here and do it. And, you know, as a way to, you know, to earn more ownership in the community. Um, And we're going to get into that, you know, as we start talking about some of these do's and don'ts. But, you know, the big point that I want to make before we dive into these do's and don'ts is, you know, as an audience builder, as you start thinking about, okay, how do I need to approach Web3? I think the way that you want to think about it is about going deep with a core group of people. In other words, building community, like real community, as opposed to simply building the largest audience possible. And this is a big difference between Web 2 and Web 3. Because, you know, monetization is not as much of a numbers game anymore, and it certainly won't be as much in the future. It's an engagement game. Now, if you can get big engagement with big numbers, awesome. You know, but I think for most of the people listening to this, it's not as much about, oh my God, I've got to get, you know, 20,000 people on an email list or get my Twitter following to, you know, to this level. That's not the point. The point is to really understand who you're talking to, find a core group of people that kind of forms your community and that you can build with. And, you know, just earlier today, before we started recording, Josh, I was doing office hours for the ETH wallet challenge. So, you know, I just hopped on Zoom and people who had questions. Yeah, they came on and asked, and it was great, you know, able to, you know, to answer questions. Because I know, you know, when you're doing this stuff for the first time, you know, setting up a wallet and transferring crypto, it can be scary. It was scary for me. It's it's still scary. Like, I I stood up another MetaMask wallet the other day, and I did, like, three (laughs) checks before I sent anything to it to make sure, like, you don't just send it off and the ether off into the ether, you know? Yes. No, 100%. And... You know, so Karen, who was who was on there, you know, we answered her questions. And then at the end, you know, she was like, I guess, you know, the one big overarching question I have is, how does this really impact me right now? And it was a great question um, mm-hmm. because, you know, for some people, this stuff, crypto and NFTs and the Web3 stuff, it may not impact you today. But this is the first do and don't that I want to highlight here, Josh, which is I do think it's important. You know, if you're someone who's listening to this podcast, you know, that, you know, I think we can assume certain things about what your life goals are, the lifestyle that you want to have, the type of business that you want to build, and the strategy that you're using to build it. I think one of the do's is that you should start gaining an understanding of what's happening here with Web3 so that you can build your business while skating to where the puck is going, not where it is, you know, to kind of use that old Wayne Gretzky adage. Even if things might not change for you on a day-to-day basis for six months or 12 months or 18 months, you know, that's going to depend on the context of your business. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, none of what we're saying here means like you've got to totally pivot and start doing all of these things differently, right? But I think it's important to at least start gaining that understanding so that you can highlight, okay, well, where are the early mover advantages for me? And what do I need to be building so that in 12 months or 18 months, I'm not left behind because people are going to start expecting this stuff. So do that and don't ignore what's happening simply because you don't see how it's going to impact your business right now. And I think that's that was kind of what I explained to Karen, and I think it it made sense. And I think that's a big point I want to make right off the top here to everybody, because I know there's some of that sentiment. Like, why do I have to pay attention to this? I'm not accepting crypto as payment. I'm not gating my content with NFTs. And that's all well and good. But these things are going to be coming, and there are opportunities there that if you're kind of on the lookout and understanding this stuff, that you're going to be able to take advantage of. And totally. And when you, if you have a great understanding of like the foundations of what's kind of going on and how an NFT works and how it can be applied in the future, like ticketing or something like that, yeah. you can see how, okay, maybe not right now, but I'm going to have to deal with this in this way, potentially in five years. I could see um, going back to voiceover and NFTs, um, a lot of the work I do is is based on licensing. So I'll license my voice to a big company for a 12 week engagement. They only get my voice for 12 weeks. And if they want to use it for another one, they got to pay me again for that same Mm. spot plus a premium. That's an NFT. 
right there. Like, 100%. That, as simple as that. And so SAG-AFTRA, the big acting union, if, <laughs> if they want to get crazy, they could create NFTs and add my voice to them or any SAG member's voice. And that NFT can return in 12 weeks. And if someone wants to use it, they have to buy it back from SAG-AFTRA. And there you go. There's no one chasing people down to to get the, the usage rights again. I, I mean, that's I, that's the first thing that comes to mind when I think of my current business and where it could be going, you know? No, absolutely. Um, I mean, that that right there is a great use case. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, think about if you're if you're a podcaster, like think about with this episode of the Seven Figure Small Podcast, right? We could, if we did a season of Seven Figure Small Podcast, we could sell an NFT for each episode and that would give you certain rights, uh, like the ability to advertise on it, the ability to, or the ability to earn a percentage of the revenue that we make if we were to sell ads on this, right? Yep. The, the possibilities are endless. We talked about this on on previous episodes. But again, the big point here is don't just ignore it because it's confusing or because you don't see the immediate change that it'll make to your business. Things are going to change. They're going to change faster than we think. And so it's important to understand that context as we go. And so this leads us into the next do and don't. And this is kind of the one I think, Josh, that you've been such a great example of in you know, the, the move community that we have on Discord. And that is do get involved early with projects and think like an owner. Because remember, the big promise of Web3, and not just the promise, but what we're already seeing it deliver on, is you know, the goal here is to redistribute ownership to the community. That's the great thing about Web3. Not to the intermediaries, not to the big platforms, but redistribute it back to and throughout the community. And so the do is to get involved early with projects and think like an owner. Don't just sit on the sidelines of projects that you're genuinely interested in because you may miss your opportunity. And, you know, kind of built into this one for me is you know, finding, you know, doing a little bit of research, finding projects you like, and then just seeing how these things are developing, I think is the best way to see the differences between how things are developing now in Web3 as opposed to Web2. And I don't, you know, some people might learn differently than me, but the way that I've learned this stuff is just to get involved, you know? And yes, you know, that can involve like spending some money to buy an NFT or whatever, but it doesn't need to. You know, there's an incredible... um project that I'm really interested in. It's called Metablocks. And it's basically, I forget the guy's name. He's like one of the like most famous guys when it comes to gamification. Um, but they're basically creating this, this series of NFTs. It's, it's basically going to be a series of NFTs that are attached to a physical location. And then people can upload their memories to this. So their goal is basically to store the world's most valuable memories, right? So like, Josh, you could own the NFT for your childhood home and upload your favorite picture to that. And then there could be a series of the people who have owned this home. And then you could... So anyway, the point is not to go down the rabbit hole of what it is. But the point is, I happened to find out about this because someone forwarded me an email and I just joined the Discord. And it's really early. There's no payment there. But I've been involved in the discussions, learning about the project, providing input, you know, and then they were asking about what I do. I was like, well, you know, I do, you know, community, you know, I do community building. And they're like, well, oh, we'd love to talk with you about how things that we could do to help our community. And so I'm able to go in there and add value while also learning about this fun project and figure out kind of how this stuff works. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, again, this idea of, you know, when you get involved early, you know, number one, you might have opportunities to gain real ownership in it. But you also get to see how these things develop, which is going to be helpful, you know, as we kind of go down this road of building these community-based businesses, it's going to be helpful just kind of seeing these things from the inside. Yeah, totally. And if you get involved early in a project like that, a lot of times you will see early movers get rewarded by the project outside of, um, well, I mean, like, first of all, if we look at like move, I know I was able to get in early and become a move VIP for a very low price, much less than, well, if you changed it back to based on move tokens, it would be much less than it would be now, similar to the way um, Tilt does their their community, right? Um, But yeah, I mean, being able to get in early, like the ENS airdrop, you and I talked about ENS back in September. I think I sent you a thing. It was like, hey, Movement Ventures is open. You should check it out. And then uh, I did not. 
get my ENS domain until November 5th or 6th after the airdrop. So oh, no. <laughs> I talked about it two months earlier and completely missed the opportunity. And it was just a matter of me going, ah, it's cool. I like it. I will eventually have an ENS, ENS domain, but I just want to see what gas prices are going to do because I don't know if I want to pay $250 USD for yeah. you know getting this domain, Oh, which would have totally been a like a home run for an investment. But uh, so... I might be jumping ahead. I'm sure we're going to talk about something like that. But um, yeah, when you can get in to a project that you're like, oh, I understand what's going on here. Like if you think Metablocks, being able to add like memories, you think of childhood homes of famous people and things like that and being able to go there mm-hmm. with an app and like look at their memories and and things that are, that are you know, kind of like a museum that like, exists on the blockchain. Yes. Mind blowing. Exactly. So yeah, it seems like a, it seems like a cool idea. And so it is. I'm going to be researching that one for sure. Yeah, it's it's cool. And and you know, so again, and th- and this is where I think you're a great example and Martin are a great example in the move community, right? Because as you get in there, you know, when we launched the the move discord, we never thought, oh, you know, well, we'll have someone from the community develop NFTs for us. But what happens organically when you get people together in a community? Opportunities come up. And this inside joke for the donut happens. And then we yeah. start thinking about doing NFTs. Again, one thing leads to another, right? Martin happened to be working on this 3D stuff. And so, you know, 3D modeling. And then he had just done a lunch and learn in the community about it, actually. And then he's like, well, let me do a 3D model of a donut. One thing leads to another. And these yeah. donuts, you know, then he does the Thanksgiving <laughs> the, uh, versions of the donuts. One of the Thanksgiving donuts. Yes, which ended up how much? And how much did you end up paying for that? Uh, Twenty-two move, which I, <laughs> 22. Way, I was way overbid. I, there was a guy that someone <laughs> somebody had like fifteen move already or ten move already on there, and I'm like, what can I bid? Yeah, I mean, but honestly, I probably paid two dollars for those move like back in September, so it was not a big. It was a, it was a small investment. If I look at how much USD I actually spent on it versus the current value of USD, yeah, but, and we'll uh, end up we'll end up doing something special for the yeah. you know for the people who yeah. hold those, you know. But and I so got it was like I want this to stay in the community too. Like I don't, yeah, want, it was someone I didn't know had the first bid on there, and so I just outbid them, knowing like I, I just want this to stay. We lost that other one though. We did. I don't know where it went. We'll have to to figure that out. We'll get it. But no, and then, you know, so Brian texts me and he's like, hey, you know, who was it again that uh, that did the NFTs? And I'm like, Martin. And he just posted that someone reached out to him about hiring Martin to do NFTs for them. So That's one fantastic. thing leads to another. But, you know, Martin, ever since we launched that, has just treated it with an ownership mentality. Like he's got stuff he wants to try. He set up the Move Marketplace where basically we're bringing together people who want to transact and move. So it's like, you know, I think you're in there. So it's like if someone wanted to hire you for a voiceover and they're willing to pay move, you might give them a discount on it and it brings mm-hmm. them together. Martin set up this whole thing with a Discord bot to do it. He's making himself an invaluable part of the community and is worth thinking about, you know, a future of when this thing is a decentralized autonomous organization. Well, you know, I mean, the people who are thinking like owners are the people who are going to earn more and more ownership and more opportunity moving forward. That's web three right there that where it's right not there, always yeah. top down. It's not like, well, let me wait for Jared to, you know, present opportunities for community members. No, no, no. You are a community member. You know what this community needs and you start doing stuff and you make yourself valuable. So, and, and it's a great way to find opportunity, but it's also a great way to learn. And so that's why I think this do and don't is so important get involved, try stuff mm-hmm. out, find projects that are interesting to you and just explore. And yep. when they're really interesting, start to think like an owner, act like yeah. one, and, and you can get rewarded. That's the difference between web two and web three. For sure. Th- and consider it part of your professional development too. If you're trying to figure out where to, where to fit it in in your day, if you do an hour of PD in a week or two or whatever, take part of it and invest it in this because I think long-term yeah. that's where this is all going. And it's, it's going to benefit you professionally to know what you're getting into. A hundred percent now. And so this leads to the next one, which is, and I have certainly learned this firsthand is develop a network, you know, don't go it alone. And the way that you develop a network is just to get involved and meet people. Again, web three is community based. You know, it's all, it's, it's digital, it's people, you know, working and collaborating online, but it's all about the relationships that you have, 
you know, people that you know who can help point you toward, you know, certain opportunities. And I say this, especially if, you know, if you're new and maybe don't know, okay, what are the good opportunities? What should I look at? Because as we'll talk about in the next one, there's certainly some stuff that you need to watch out for, you know, but one thing that really helped me, you know, when we launched our, our, um, move coin, you know, we became part of this Twitter group with a bunch of other creators who had coins on rally. And most of these people, you know, these are early people who were able to get coins on rally. They had businesses, you know, they were at different stages of their, you know, how kind of embedded in, in this web three movement that we're in, but they all had really relevant experience. And a lot of them have been able to point me towards really good opportunities. You know, one of the guys in there was, you know, kind of pressing us to, Hey, get your ENS domain. Not because, hey, three months from now, there's going to be an airdrop of tokens because no one knew that. Mm -hmm. But it was, hey, you know, ENS is going to be a foundational part of Ethereum and of Web3. So you should be doing this. You know, same guy who actually pointed me toward the uh, the pool suite NFT drop uh, Very cool. <laughs> you know, from over the weekend, yeah. which seems like it's going to be a really good project. And I would have had no knowledge of that. But as you start to build the network of people that you trust and who have kind of been around, you can share some of those opportunities. And that helps to guide where you're going to go and invest your time and kind of help you understand what you're getting yourself into. But the only way that you do that is just by getting involved in some of these projects. So it really goes along with with that last one. Um, you know, develop a network um, so yeah, that you totally have... Offloads, it offloads the extra work you have to do sometimes. There's, there's a level of... I mean, it kind of makes it like crypto, right? Crypto being trustless in a lot of ways. You don't have to trust the entity you're interacting with because you know the blockchain is going to potentially um, is going to take care of your your transactions. Um, well, you, you should trust them all the same. But like knowing I trust you, if you bring an opportunity to me, that all of a sudden lowers the the amount of work I have to do. I've off offloaded some of the research to you because I trust you, and so it'll make it easier for me to start digging into a product. Although when you told me about pool suite, I did not do that because I was caulking my driveway. So <laughs> I was filling cracks and I was out of position to, to look into it. But, but it's one where I'm like, Oh yeah, Jared's told me about crypto dads and pool suite. And we talked about ENS and all these have really worked out. So yeah. So Jared has become my research. That said, I still did not get into pool suite simply because I did not have the time to do the research. So I stepped stepped back from it, and you know maybe I'll buy secondary if I like where the project ends up going, but it looks cool. Well, but okay, so and that's a good lesson because that leads us in to the next one, which is do properly weight the reward part of the risk reward equation, but don't ignore the risk and don't ignore the personal responsibility of doing your own research. You know, it's kind of a buzzword that you'll hear a lot when you first start getting into this stuff. This is not investment advice. Do your own research. And that's all true. Absolutely. But don't take it for granted. Right. So like, you know, the the pool suite example, this was an NFT that gave access to this private community. I didn't find out about it until like two hours before the mint. Right. And like signed up and it was kind of quick. And I was able I was actually at Costco at the time. And I just like stood off to the side and like did some research <laughs> and kind of and kind of found out about it, you know, learn more about it. And I was like, okay, I get this. The person behind it has done a lot of really interesting things. This seems solid. It's not particularly expensive to do. I think this is worth a shot. And they're not doing a whole lot of these NFTs, so I can probably sell the NFT if it doesn't work out very well. This is worth it. Let me do it. Right. So there was risk. But there's also a reward. And the reward is, hey, you know, this thing, A, might be valuable. And B, as I'm starting to look, you know, A, the person who recommended it to me has been spot on. And he even said, you know, there's going to be a lot of heavy hitters that are in this community. Okay, these are a lot of Web3 people. This is the kind of community that I want to be in and learn from. Reward outweighed the risk. Contrast that with Bankbox, which is a project on Solana uh, recently where it was a very compelling promise, right? It's like, okay. And someone I trust recommended this to me as well. Said, hey, boy, this yeah. looks like a cool project. And it sure did. You know, the idea was, okay, you mint this box and each, you know, there were four different rarity levels. And so if at each box that you mint, you were going to get paid basically a guaranteed dividend of Sol, which is the native token of the Solana um, blockchain, 
right? So let's say that you get one of the one of the um, most rare ones. Well, you would get two soul every month, and the cost to mint the thing was only one soul. So if this all worked out well, and you got one of the rare ones, you're paying one soul to then every month get two soul as a dividend. And they had a lot of promises on there about how they had secured sponsorships, they were earning their revenue from a Bitcoin mining rig, yada, yada. What they didn't have was verification of any of these promises, and the founders mm. were not publicly known. So I'm looking at this, and I posted about this in the Discord, where I was like, all right, this is interesting, because, boy, the promise is compelling. You know, if you can yeah. get in early here, this it seems like a reasonable promise if you get in early on a community, but red flag, red flag, red flag. There were some big red flags. So to make a long story short, turns out they open up the mint. A whole bunch of people go in and mint their one soul. 12 hours later, the website was gone. Their Twitter was gone. <laughs> Discord was shut down. They took all that money and left. And you have no recourse. None. No recourse. No recourse. So, but in that case... As you look at it, to me, once I started adding it up down the line, the reward was not worth the risk because there were too many red flags where it's like, man, you know, and if you're getting into some of this stuff early and you don't know, ask kind of someone who's been around the block. But those are some of the things to look for. If the founders aren't known, be very wary. If they don't have verification of some of these claims they're making for where funds are going to come from, be skeptical, right? But... What you don't want to do, because I hear this all the time, is it's like, oh, well, you know, there's scammers out there, so I'm not going to get involved. Yes, there are scammers out there. But if you just allow yourself to live in fear and avoid the whole thing because there's scammers out there, you also miss the potential for reward. So you got to try to properly weight the reward part of that risk-reward equation, but don't ignore the risk. And I know that can be kind of a difficult needle to thread sometimes, but those two recent examples, just from the last week of my experience, I think really highlight kind of the thought process that you want to go through as you're trying to think these things through. It'll never be perfect, but I think you can put yourself in a good position to get involved with good ones and avoid bad ones if you have a few checkpoints that are kind of your must-haves. Yeah, totally. And like going back to my point about like Jared doing some of my research for me, offloading that research... All that really does is pass my first check of like, okay, this is a project I want to look at. Right. Like Pool Suite was Pool Suite's a project I want to look at and could have potentially minted if I had the time to do the research before the mint. But yeah, you found out two hours before. I think you sent me the message not long after that. And uh, yeah, I just I just didn't have the bandwidth to to do my research and I wasn't going to just throw ETH at something that sounded like it was pretty cool just because Jared said it. Right. <laughs> but it's it definitely passes the first wall of this is a project I want to look at. Not It doesn't pass all my other checks of who are the founders? What are they doing with it? Does that even make sense? <laughs> like there's so many there's so many NFT projects out there right now. I think what well, like we've talked the uh I think the projects are running into a wall where they got all this money at a mint and now they're not necessarily doing a rug pull, but they've just run into some hurdles that they don't have the experience to over to overcome. And you wouldn't really know that if you can't look into the founders and their backgrounds and you can't see what other projects they've done. Oh, we're going to launch a game and we're going to do this in the metaverse and all that stuff, but they have no game development background. They're a full stack developer, but that means nothing you know these i was a full stack developer like and all i basically did was stand up wordpress sites and a couple of you know web apps um but i did it on the full stack so but that doesn't make me qualified to actually mint nfts for people and to develop a video game like that's that's a right. different world so so yeah understand that like if you can if you can do some research around the founders even if you don't know their actual name, but you can tie their Web3 uh, persona back to some successful projects, then maybe you can start moving forward with whether or not you want to look at it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm actually going through this right now with a potential project. So a fellow, uh, you know, person who runs online communities that I know recommended this new kind of community, web three community management tool that is in the earliest stages of being developed, right? It's called Beyond. And I mean, early, early stages, but they've got this early mint possible 
for basically like a founder level NFT where if you buy it right now and it's the earliest, like the first 20 people to buy it, I think it's like 0.25 ETH, you know, so roughly a little more than a thousand dollars. You can, for the lifetime of this product, use it f- and you have a license for as many different communities as you want to. And it's this really promising, almost like CMS layer that would go on top of other uh, community, you know, tokens and like discords and things that you would use. Really, really interesting. But it's like, okay, that's not a lot, but I mean, still, that's a thousand bucks. And, yeah. you know, if this thing, it's a really compelling promise because if it works, my goodness, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great investment. That's a, that's a great deal for a lifetime license on software you like. Not to mention, it really if is. it's good, and not, even if I move away from the software, but it's good, I could resell it and recoup a lot of that investment back, right? Very or point, just yeah. use this software without a recurring charge. But if it's not, and they don't deliver, or it goes in a direction that I don't like, well, now I've, you know, if I'm out some money that, you know, that I would like to have. So, you know, going on and researching his LinkedIn, talking to some other people, I want to try and get a demo, trying to do some of that, you know, some of that research to figure that out. So this idea of kind of doing your own research, again, I know it can be scary that it feels like sometimes there can be like danger lurking around the corner. That's a good feeling to have. There is danger lurking around the corner. So allow allow that to motivate you not to run away, but just to do a little bit more research and going back to the network, develop a network of people that you can bounce stuff off of, get good ideas from. This is what Web3 is all about. It's about the community and about the network and all of those things. So, but I, I do, I, I just, I do think it's important if you're kind of on the fence about this stuff, don't let fear keep you from some really promising early opportunities that are all over the place. They really yeah, are still sure. all I over mean, the place. We're getting a chance here potentially to get in as series A investors without the capital you need to be in the first stages of investment in huge companies. Yeah. Like this is, but on that same, that same regard, this is also very similar to like the dot-com bubble, you know, and it's the NFT world is a lot, reminds me a lot of the ICO world back in like 2017, where Ethereum just came out and everyone was spinning up their own token. And there would be this situation where you would jump in and they'd be like, send some ETH to this wallet because the smart contracts weren't a real thing back then, I guess. (laughs) And uh, they would say, send some ETH to this wallet. And based on how much you send, you'll get a certain number of coins or tokens when we drop them. And it's like, there was talk about trustless, like yeah. literally just funneling ETH out and hoping you'd get some back. And uh, yeah, thankfully today there's some more checks in place. But but you also have to watch out because, yeah, there could be potentials where you don't get what is promised or because they can't deliver or because they never intended to deliver. Yeah. But yeah, if you do your research, just like a Series A investor or an early investor in a like a large project, you get to have that early adopter upside that as normal citizens without millions of dollars in the bank liquid we we don't have those opportunities right now and sure the upside might not be quite as huge but it could be in some yep. situations yeah and so the last point that i want to highlight on that going back to karen's question right where okay maybe you don't see how this is going to impact you right now but what do all of us need to create the outsized impact that, that we want as small businesses. We need to use technology to help us do things. We need tools. We need SaaS products. Well, this example with the Beyond software, if you think that you're going to be running a community at any point in the future, a year from now, two years from now, getting in early on a community platform that is being built with the fundamentals of Web3, well, you may set yourself up to save a ton of money in the future. There's several other of these similar type projects that I'm involved in simply because I like this idea of getting in early. You know, maybe you can get tokens, maybe you can help steer the direction of it. But that's where I think for folks who don't quite understand it, you know, cling to that. Find the um, some of these developing projects that may be software programs that you would use in the future and get involved early to get some of the ownership, to get some of the perks. That is a very real world example of things you can do right now just to set yourself up for success with this stuff down the road. Yeah. And to one more point on that, uh, similar to software products, look for stuff that is a large cornerstone of our life right now and how it's going to be adapted. Who's trying to adapt that to Web3? 
And so obviously not financial advice, but Loan Snap is out there launching Bacon Coin and Be Home, and they're funding mortgages with USDC. You submit USDC, you get some Be Home tokens that are equivalent to it, and then eventually you're going to get coins that come in as like a governance token, and then you'll be able to launch off different subsets of mortgage pools for maybe apartments or whatever. And so it, I mean, you have to look like where, where are people trying to adapt current use cases and, and taking that and putting them on the blockchain, moving them into web three tech, um, similar to SaaS products. Like so people are, it's just everything like that. They're, they're closing mortgages in 24 hours. Like that, if for anyone who's refinanced a house or bought a house, that's life changing in itself. Mm hmm. Yeah. And on that point, I'll add just one quick do or don't here that we don't even have on our sheet, which is, and it goes along with this, which is do look for opportunities to invest your time and attention. Don't focus only on opportunities where you have to invest your money. That's the other thing that I hear a lot. It's like, well, I don't have a lot of excess money right now to invest in crypto. And I totally get that. You know, not everybody does. And that's fine. But that is not, that doesn't, that's not your out. <laughs> Just because you yeah. say that, that is not, that doesn't get you out of, I think it's not a responsibility, but I, it, it doesn't get you out of all this opportunity that's there because you don't have to invest money, right? You can invest, you can be valuable with your time and attention and you can still earn ownership stakes in these things. And if nothing else, help guide products that may be important to you down the road. You know, and yeah. again, it goes back to now time and attention has a real value on it. So I think you want to choose your projects wisely, but you do not have to have X amount of USD to convert into ETH, to buy NFTs, to get into this. No, mm -hmm. that is one path, but your time and attention to early developing communities is really, really valuable. And now instead of just getting a pat on the back, you might actually get tokens that have real value or yeah. input that has real value. That's there. I've seen it. I'm experiencing it right now. Find those opportunities. If you don't have the money, you can invest in other ways. Yeah, at the very least, your understanding will pay off dividends later. Like your your knowledge and understanding gained. At some point, you're going to come across yes. a product where either it's going to touch your life as a user or touch your life as you're going to be like, oh, this is the one. Like I found the project that I'm passionate about and I really like, and I'm going to, I'm going to get involved now, you know? Yeah. And like you said, you know, just seeing how these communities develop for your own community building, you know, strategies in the future, the more that you kind of get reps of seeing how other people do it, it'll just help you be a better Web3 community builder moving forward, which I think everybody listening to this podcast probably should think of themselves as a Web3 community builder, because that's what you're going to have to be to be successful. Um, okay, so one more uh, do or don't that I had, and then we're going to get to the one that you had as well, Josh. Um, and this is, this kind of goes back to what you did the tutorial videos on for the community. And that is, do get non-custodial wallets and take control of your crypto. So non-custodial means, a custodial wallet, for example, is like, uh, like Coinbase. Like if you buy crypto on Coinbase, you're holding it in the Coinbase exchange, they own your crypto. If they were to get hacked and someone steals those keys, you're out right? They have it. You are not the one in control of it. So you want to get what's called a non-custodial wallet, like MetaMask or like Coinbase wallet. I know that can be a little bit confusing, but Coinbase wallet is a non-custodial wallet where you're the one in control of the private keys and you control your crypto. Do that. You want to do that if you're going to get into any serious amount of crypto, but don't be unserious in how you manage and store your private keys. Don't just jot them on a napkin and you know, let that yeah. go to wherever. Don't you know? You've got to be serious uh, about this stuff, um, you know, to make sure that you don't lose it. So there's kind of a, a balance there. But you know, there there haven't been many uh, stories of exchanges getting hacked recently, but it has happened in the past. Um, but just because you put it on a non custodial wallet doesn't mean you're protected forever. You're on your own to keep those private keys, keep everything secure, uh, and make sure that they don't get into the wrong hands so that you keep control of the coins that you do either pay your money for or that you earn through your time and attention. Yeah. I mean, that's a resp responsibility that we're not really used to. It's similar to yeah. keeping your money in a mattress, except your mattress is cut up and stored in a multiple <laughs> places and 
all of the individual pieces of the mattress have access to your full mattress account. Like <laughs> you, that's a terrible analogy, a but, great- <laughs> but, but, uh, but you really, you like, it's a change in the way you manage your money, but that's also a cornerstone of the culture of crypto is being a custodian of your own assets. You, you get to take care of it. You're not depending on a bank to take care of it. And that's, I mean, that's one more thing that I, we don't have written down as a do is do start to understand the underlying values of cryptocurrency and yeah. decentralization. And, and that makes it easier to, to understand what's going on as a whole out here and in the, in the ecosystem. And yes. one of them is being a custodian of your own money. Yeah. And, I, and to go along with that, understand the projects that you get involved in. Not just, oh, look, the number's going up and this seems like a smart investment. And I read an article where, you know, the projected coin price is supposed to be 3x two months from now. By the way, never trust those articles. (laughs) There's no Um, way to tell that. (laughs) No, there is no way to tell that. But what there is a way to tell if you're looking is, is this a good technology? Are there good people behind this? Does this solve a real world problem? You know, do they have a track record of, you know, being around for a while? Those fundamentals... Once you understand that, now you're going to be more likely to hold through the downtimes because the volatility is insane. It's truly insane. Like just three days ago, my entire portfolio dropped like 25%. And now today it's up like the same amount. Like it just, woo, it goes up and down. So if you don't actually have conviction about what you're investing in, those short-term, the short-term volatility is going to get you. So really understanding the stuff that you're getting involved in, not just having like a spray and pray type mentality, but like, you know, getting involved in a few things that you really believe in and that you understand that I think is the best policy for actually doing this the smart way. And then the the last thing that I'll say too is, and I know we're getting in this discussion right now is getting a little bit in the weeds of like actually buying crypto, investing in crypto. And if you have questions about any of the stuff that we've talked about, like non-custodial wallets, all this, um, I'll put some links to like, you know, places where you can understand the terms in the show notes, but also just reach out like on Twitter at Jared Morris or email me, Jared unemployable.com. I'm always happy to, you know, kind of answer these questions, help onboard people. Um, cause sometimes it's just getting one answer that'll help you, you know, get past, you know, a stumbling block or fear that you have. But the last thing to remember when it comes to taking control of your crypto is you got to be careful what wallet you're sending any cryptocurrency to. It's got to be a match. So for example, like you can't, like if you have some Bitcoin, you can't just send this to any old wallet because if you send it to an Ethereum wallet, it's not a match and you'll lose it. Like literally, you'll lose it. There's no way to get it back. There's no customer service to call it's lost. Bitcoin has to go to a Bitcoin wallet. Ethereum has to go to an ERC-20 wallet. So again, none of those terms may make sense, but just know that if you're going to get into investing in crypto, it's now your responsibility to understand what that means and how to do it. And I triple check these things, quadruple check these things still to this day, even when I'm sending stuff. And that's a smart policy. You want to make sure you get that part right. Well, you have to, or you're going to lose. Yeah, you have, you you have no choice. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah. could zero yourself pretty, pretty <laughs> accidentally, and and not that's not to scare anyone, but it's really just to say, you know, be vigilant. Like, yes. there's really there's nothing else to say. Like, be vigilant, and once you do it a few times, you get more comfortable. Like, I just sent some some soul over to Phantom today without even like thinking twice about it, and I just double checked the wallet, hit send, and I was it was good. Like, mm-hmm. it was really. I mean, it, I was happy when it showed up. I still get equally ecstatic when it works. <laughs> yes. Um, there's always, but, there's uh, always that slight moment, like until it's there, uh, I'm still yeah, always really gone. nervous. <laughs> I, that's one thing I do like Solana over, over Ethereum for, because it's like you click it and sometimes by the time Phantom loads, it's already there. Yes. It makes me feel pretty good. Um, Ethereum is usually pretty quick, but it's, it, it can take a little bit longer. Yes. Yes. All right. Let's hit the, the do or don't that you have here, Josh. Yeah, my big one really just comes from my own personal experience um, in resisting the FOMO or the fear of missing out. The, the, a lot of like a lot of the hype out there in NFT projects and some coins and stuff is all FOMO. And so, like, have a list of principles that you want for a project. So if you decide not to get into something or if things are throwing up red flags for you and you don't get into a project and then it still hypes and it takes off and you're like, oh, I was totally wrong about that as far as like a speculation thing goes, you don't feel bad. 
because back when I first got into this in 2017, I'd probably be better off today, uh, portfolio size, if I would have stayed in back in 2017. I did stay in, but I didn't continue to dollar cost average my way into the market. Um, but the ICO craze was going nuts. And like I mentioned earlier, you'd send Ethereum off to some random wallet in hopes that you'd get some tokens when the when the coin actually came out. But uh, but when everything kind of fell, I realized that, or, well, okay, so going back to FOMO, first of all, uh, if I missed out on a project, I would then look at it and see it taking off and go, oh, I need to buy in. I need to, I need to hurry up and yeah. get in. And I would buy in and then everyone would sell their bags and I bought the peak. And it would just, it would just tumble. And that happened to me on a couple of occasions where I basically traded my funds away. Thankfully, I was playing with very like little money at the time. So, I mean, it was probably less than a thousand dollars total. So it was not really destroying me financially in any way. Yeah. But, uh, but don't worry if you, if you do miss a project and it takes off, there's always a new, I saw something in our discord today, like yet another project, like a new day, a new crypto project that I haven't heard of. Like it's, I think it was from Heath or something in there. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's just another day, another hundred thousand new crypto projects spinning up. Like you'll find another one. If you happen to miss out, figure out what you liked about the project and what you maybe missed that ended up being such a good characteristic and uh, use those as part of your principles to apply to projects you look at in the future. Um, like, for example, I've started doing that with Crypto Dads because we talked about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then I saw the after mint, the floor drop to like 0.15 Ether and slept on it for a whole weekend. And then it was at 0.4 Ether. I'm like, actually, I do really want to be a part of this project. I could have had three dads for the cost of the one I bought. Mm -hmm. But I'm still happy, even though it's dro the floor has since dropped below my floor dad. I'm still happy to have it and hold it because the project has turned out to be really great. And once again, a project that uh, has founders that you, I mean, you've talked to in person, you've seen their faces Yeah, that you can't really, you can't really beat that. You know, these guys are working on it and you know, they might just be treading water a little bit at times trying to spin up different things, but, but stuff is, I mean, they're there, they're working on the project and they have a reputation to uphold. Yeah. Um, and they and built so a good it's also community. Okay. Yeah, they did build a great community. And it's also okay, like in this case, I'm comfortable knowing that I paid a premium, a little extra money to watch things unfold and understand that, oh, the things I might have been afraid of didn't actually come to fruition. The project's good. I'm going to pay an extra premium to to step in a little bit late, but I still get to be a part of this project. And I don't worry about the short-term loss that that had. You know, in two or three years, this might be a really cool project to be a part of. And at the worst case scenario, it's a really cool community to be a part of. Yeah, man, this is such an important one. And it's, <clears throat> it's really one of the biggest kind of changes that's happened in my mindset because the FOMO is hard to avoid early on. I got in for the first time in, Burns. you know, yeah, April, or May of 2021, of course, when a lot of things hit their all time high. And I mean, I'm, you know, seeing this stuff go up and it, in that moment, it feels like it's going to go up forever. So you're like, well, I better get in it right now. No, no, this is crypto. Things go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. It's just that over time, the trends for most of the good projects have been really positive, but there's big gulfs on the way there. Yeah. So you, you always... The highs are higher and the lows are higher. So yeah, everything, right. <laughs> everything is higher over time, but yeah, it, it, it's it does feel at times it's going to go up forever. Yeah. But at any given moment, like if you're really excited about something, but it's kind of on a run up, just wait because it'll come back down and there will be, there, there will be a better opportunity. But I think, you know, the biggest thing that I've learned is when it comes to this is focus on the fundamentals, not the FOMO. Because one thing that you want to remember is, you know, founders who create projects, they obviously want as much hype as possible. And they're hiring community managers and admins and incentivizing people to go out on Twitter and create hype and get you all excited, right? But that doesn't change the fundamentals of the project. It just changes your emotional attachment to it at any given moment. Try to step away from the emotion and look at the fundamentals 
of the project. And if you know the fundamentals are good, then try and think, okay, when's the best time for me to step in? Is there a little bit of a dip right now? Let me hop in right now. Does it look like it's running pretty hot right now? It'll probably come back down. The world's not going to change in like three or four days, you know, and these cycles are pretty short term. So, you know, and the other thing to think about is, you know, fate is going to smile on you and it's going to slap you in the face, right? So, you know, a lot of people have probably heard about the Constitution Dow story where this, you know, a bunch of people came together, raised 40 plus million dollars for the Constitution. If you were part of this, which I was, you paid your money and you got people tokens in return. And the promise was, okay, if we buy the Constitution, the people tokens will be the governance tokens that we'll use to figure out the future of what we do with it. And if we don't buy the Constitution, then we'll refund you and you're just out the gas fees. Okay. Seemed like a good promise to me. I was in. Fun project to be a part of. But they didn't end up getting it. And about a week later, they were like, okay, you know, we're not going to go forward and try and get any other projects. So here's how you get your refund. You redeem your people tokens. You trade your people tokens in for the refund. So I did that. About 48 hours later, people tokens were trading at like 30 times the value of what they had been. There was no reason for this to happen. The tokens (laughs) governed nothing. It was a total meme coin. A meme coin meaning a bunch of people got excited about it and hyped it up and it rose for no no utility reason just for the meme value of it. Had I held for 48 hours... Well, it was it would have been many, many thousands of dollars of just like bonus free money. And it's just like, what the heck, man? Yeah. But but I my process for doing that was still pretty sound. Like I just wanted to get my refund and it didn't seem like there was any reason. On the flip side, ENS, right? The ENS drop, you know, I went and got my ETH domain because I thought it would be a smart thing to do. Let me just get Jared.eth so no one else can get it. And so I have it in the future. And three months later you know, many, many thousands of dollars worth of tokens just showed up in my wallet. I did nothing. I had no expectation of this. I did nothing to have it, but it showed up. So if you get into crypto, again, fate's going to smile on you and it's going to slap you in the face as those two stories illustrate and kind of cancel each other out. But what really matters to me is the stuff that I've gotten involved in either as a monetary investor or investing my time and attention. And certainly MoveCoin is part of that you know, home coin, the coin that I launched for the assembly call, that stuff is all part of that. Those are the fundamentals. And those are the projects that are most interesting to me. And that long term, I'm going to, you know, stick with as an investor, because I think, you know, whether it's my time and attention, or whether it's the money that I've invested, I think there's going to be a long term gain. And all this other stuff that happens in the meantime, honestly, it's just noise. It really is. And if you focus too much on it or try to chase the next airdrop or, you know, you FOMO back into people coin because now it's going up and you're like, well, damn it, I want to get a piece of this. No, the opportunity has gone. If the fundamentals aren't there, you're going to be better off sticking with the fundamentals, not FOMOing in to the next meme coin, because by the time that the meme coin is getting really popular, it might be about the time that it's going to drop. So stick with the fundamentals over the FOMO in whatever type of investing you're doing, you know, and you're going to be so much better off. Yeah. I mean, when you saw people spike like that, you probably, your heartbeat probably went up, but you probably didn't lose sleep. You probably didn't lose sleep. I did not lose sleep. I did not lose sleep. You stuck to your principles. You stuck to your principles. You're like, I got what I could, but what I knew I was going to get back, which was my investment minus gas. And I don't, since I don't own a part of the constitution. um, It was a fun conversation with my wife. She's like, wait, what did you do? What happened I mean, here? <laughs> it's oh like, yeah. there was no way I to did. know this was going to happen. It's funny. <laughs> I had that same conversation with my wife about uh, ENS. Like, I was like, I talked to this dude. He, uh, he, we talked about the ENS domains. He got one and and got an airdrop of a bunch of uh, a bunch of stuff. And uh, you know, I did not get one at the same time, and I did not get an airdrop. And she, I mean, but I didn't get it do? because I, I knew long term I wanted one. I just at the time wasn't ready to get into it. So I don't, I don't feel bad because I don't yeah. feel like I missed out because I never had it, you know? Right. Um, but I also like, I, what's more interesting to me is knowing that long term, that ENS domain, I think is going to be, it's going to be equivalent to, because I believe in Ethereum long term, I think it's going to be equivalent to having a, a dot com mm-hmm. as simple as that. Like, yep. yeah. So absolutely. 
So look, again, I think getting back to you know, to the main overarching point here, which really goes back to Karen's questions, like why should I care about this stuff right now? And again, it's to be able to put yourself, put your business in a position where it's going to be able to take advantage of these opportunities, even if you know you can't take advantage of them right now, six months, 12 months, 18 months down the road, the context is going to be very different. You want to be ready for that context. And in the meantime, there are opportunities to take advantage of if you look for them, if you're open-minded about it, and you can quote unquote profit from these opportunities, not just by getting tokens or not just from having an investment that appreciates, but from what you learn and the real ownership that you can gain in in new projects. And so I, I really just want to stress that point, you know, to anybody who's kind of on the fence on should I be paying attention to this stuff? Should I not? You definitely should be paying attention to it. The level of involvement you even have, that's obviously a personal decision. But I would like to encourage and gently nudge people away from the fear of getting involved and more toward the enthusiasm for finding a good opportunity because it's fun and it can really be rewarding um, in a lot of different ways. For sure. Yeah, you're not going to... I mean, the more you, the more time you spend in, t- in it, investigating and learning about the, the ecosystem, the more room you make for serendipity, right? You're going to like, ENS was Great a total, point. it was total serendipity for you. I mean, it, it really was. And it's just a matter of like, oh, this is something you're like, I understand this project. I know what it is. And it's, it's going to be great long term. And then they launched their DAO and drop a bunch of coins on people. Like that's, if you weren't doing the research, you, you'll never find any of those opportunities. Right? No, and 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 you know what? So and that's a that's a, an interesting example. And I think what you just said about serendipity is is really smart. You know, it does. The more that you do, the more you put yourself in a position for that. Mm-hmm. But I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about ENS because I'm not that concerned about. I don't know enough about it to feel no. like I I can you know really use those governance tokens, I'm going to try and be a responsible steward of that until maybe I sell them at a certain point. But what's an even better example of the reason to get into this stuff. So Brian and I launched MoveCoin, right? And it represented a pretty big pivot for what we were doing, you know, to launch this creator coin, you know, do it on rally, you know, it kind of shifted the direction that we were going in some of the teaching that we were doing, because we just saw the world shifting beneath our feet and beneath everybody's feet. And our goal is to figure this stuff out and help you figure it out. Well, through the process of doing that, I figured out a new way to kind of move forward with the assembly call, a project that I've had for 10 years that I was really struggling to see what the future was, that I had serious discussions with my wife this off season about, you know, we've done this for 10 years. It's really something that we want to keep doing with, you know, a new baby and all these other, you know, things, you know, going you know, kind of pulling my time, but going through this process allowed me to see a completely new avenue for how we build the community for the assembly call, which now became a collective with other content creators and a coin that is going to allow us to create community ownership and grow this in a completely different way where it becomes so much more valuable. There's more economic activity. And because other people in our community are empowered, I'm going to be able to do less while creating more content and better content because that's what Web3 enables is community ownership, community involvement, a better way to compensate people for work that they do, ownership that they can gain. So meaning I didn't understand that I was going to figure that out for this project, but by doing it, I figured it out and pivoted in a way that has given us now a first mover advantage. I mean, this is the first you know, college sports, one of the first sports content properties that is moving in this direction. That's going to be valuable. And so you don't always know what insights or what directions or what things you're going to learn that are going to change what you're doing. So, you know, to Karen and the other people that are thinking about that question, I don't know exactly how it's going to impact your business because I don't know your business and your context. But I really think if you get into this stuff and learn, you're going to find out the ways that it will. And that's much more valuable than, you know, an airdrop that you luck into or any of that other stuff. You know, how is this going to affect what you're doing, not just now, but in the future? You just got to get in there and, and kind of explore and find out. But the exploring part is really, really fun. It really is. Yeah. And that's a that's actually a really good point that I should probably um, 
mentioned that I struggle with sometimes not seeing the, the some of the opportunities through like the short term gain. The NS airdrop obviously is a short term gain, but what you've done investing with like the home coin and all of that work through through assembly call and your collective there, like that becomes much much bigger long term and yeah. is and the crypto space is really all like it's a lot of people are really looking for the next moonshot or the next big airdrop and it's it's hard to not get caught up in that even in like these conversations where you mm-hmm. just, like i find myself pointing back into that as a, just a good recency example but but uh but it's not it's not really about the 1600 percent increase that you see in a coin or whatever it's it's about long term and yes. understanding that you know in 10 years what does this potentially mean as like a media conglomerate for college sports i mean it could be huge you could have potentially just opened the door to something enormous and it's all about that you're you're there and you're ready for it and that is serendipity exactly in a nutshell because exactly you were paying attention yep paying attention and have been able to move past some of the fear to just get in there and do the exploring and see what you learn. And I think that's a good, that's a good note to end on. Wow. This is one of the longest seven figure small episodes we've had, but it's so much fun. These episodes are going so fast. I mean, man, I could, (laughs) we could be here for another two hours and I would probably, I mean, I've got notes that we haven't even touched. So, (laughs) well, is there, before? I mean, before we get off, is there anything that's, that's worthwhile to cover? The last thing is just like to stick to your principles and understand like I, I've been toying with this idea and maybe I'll try to do it is figure out like create like a scorecard of things like you want to look at for a project and and rate like founder, rate technology, rate long term, rate cost of entry, rate community and figure out, OK, if you can have like a heuristic that you score these projects on and then you use your gut reaction maybe maybe that's a way you can start figuring out so i i mean we talked about like sharing projects inside the discord community maybe there's a template that needs to be built that's like oh we have to fill all these things out before you can share it because you have to show that you did a little bit of research before you even drop it in you know dude um yes let's do this i guess i'll have to <laughs> i guess i'll this. have to create that now i just <laughs> volunteered myself Oh, you're thinking like an owner in the move community. Yeah, so that's what it's all about. But I, I do, I do have to say, man, I've, I'm so happy that you guys created that community. Like the unemployable initiative over on Circle has been been really cool, and there's a lot of like like minded people there. But knowing that this is something I wanted to research more, and then all of a sudden you open the doors to a bunch of other people who are in a similar world as far as building a business goes, and then also has their eye to the future and what Web three and crypto is out there doing. Like it just, it really has clicked for me. So that's good. It's been a great, uh, a great experience in there. I'm glad. By the way, if you're listening to this, even if you're not a part of the unemployable initiative, we would love for you to be, you can go to unemployable.com slash community and find out about that, but you can join the coin collective. You can join our discord, you go to movecoin.net. You have to own a certain amount of move and then you can access the discord. It's coin gated. So you put in this little command, it checks to make sure that you have the right number of coins. And then all these discussion channels that Josh is talking about and that we've discussed, those open up to you. It's that easy. Go to, you just go to movecoin.net and you can do that right now. So there's a lot of different ways that you can connect and learn more. Futurefreedom.com is certainly one. That is a really detailed you know, premium education platform where you're basically getting all of Brian's latest thoughts on this stuff, which are... you know. Incredibly They're valuable. Also gold. I am also over there. Yeah, <laughs> yes. it's it's some good stuff. It's you can tell Brian's been thinking hard about this stuff. Yes, yes, he has. So that's where you get all of his, you know, latest thinking about it. Um, and then obviously in the community, and then over at the Coin Collective. And I'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes uh, so that you know. But you know, I get really a lot of motivation and a lot of enthusiasm about helping people who were in the spot I was just in April of this year and bring them along with education, with a little bit of motivation, and with the comfort of a friendly hand that you can trust to help steer you in the right direction. You know, and so I, you know, for anybody who who's kind of looking for that, that's what the Coin Collective is. That's what we're doing in the Unemployable Initiative. And I'd love to be that person because I already know how much of an impact it's made for me and the different projects I'm involved with. And I love seeing the light bulb click for others. So anyway, 
come join us somewhere if you're interested in this stuff or just keep listening to the podcast because we'll, t- we'll keep talking about it. But if you want to go a little bit deeper, come join us because there's so much opportunity out there and it's the early days and you can get your, your piece of the action. Well, Josh, thanks, man. This was a lot of fun. Hey, yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we were able to fill an hour in a lot of change, probably. <laughs> it's great. Good. And obviously none of this was financial advice. I think no, you have to have that disclaimer, right? No, it was not. It's not financial <laughs> advice at all. Uh, it's 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 mindset advice, though. It's definitely mindset advice, sure. but not financial advice. You got to do your own research on projects to get yeah. into, and and so much of that is based on your own context. You know, what's your investment profile? Do you have money to invest? Do you have time or attention to invest? You know, what are you going to do? Only you can figure that stuff out. But definitely, I think you know, take the mindset stuff that we talked about and uh, start figuring out you know, where, where the, bl- the place of, is for you to get involved. Don't be afraid of the future because the future is now. Right? It's coming. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Josh, thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening. We'll be back next week uh, with a new episode. I think that's going to be kind of a special episode with a special announcement. Don't hold me to it because it's possible that could get delayed or maybe we do it another one. But there's going to be a special announcement coming up on the Seven Figure Small Podcast either next week or the week after. So I will just tease that. Brian should be back for that. Um, But when he goes away again, we'll do more of these uh, Unemployable Initiative member conversations because they're a lot of fun. (laughs) These are fun. Thanks for having me. It's a blast. Take care, everybody. We'll talk to you next week.